Hi, I'm Doug Stevenson for Press Plus One. I'm joined by John Kastner for his film NCR, uh, Not Criminally Responsible. And of course, uh, this is the story of Sean Clifton, his attack on Julie Bouvier, but also a lot about the institutions involved uh, in the entire story. And I, I was really interested to read about this film because for you, you've done kind of a, a couple of different films now with a background in health and, and those types of themes and also themes uh, around uh, the Canadian justice system. Um, so it seemed like almost too perfect that you would combine the two into this film. Why do you choose to tackle these themes? Well, I, I was a professional actor and when I was a young guy, and when I was about 17 years old, I actually played the lead in a National Film Board training film for prison guards, okay. and I got to spend three weeks in Collins Bay Penitentiary, and what you do when you're an actor, you wait around for them to set up the camera and the lights, and we, I just spent my days talking to murderers and bank robbers and rapists and your 17-year-old boy, and I was absolutely hooked. So I keep coming back to film about criminals and uh, I also do a lot of films about health and another kind of subculture I guess right where when you're in a hospital or that sort of care setting uh, it's a lot like maybe inside a prison where people outside wouldn't know what goes on yes that's true and they're also both crisis ridden institutions there there's huge dramas daily uh, in both kinds mm -hmm. of institutions and things change very quickly for for people in those institutions so it's it's a, it's a world apart it's kind of like you know, because I only go into one institution at a time for a long time. It's kind of like landing on Venus for a year right. and saying, okay, you've never been on the planet Venus. I'm going to show you now what it's like in here. Yeah. So there is a similar fascination, I guess, yeah. yeah. We were talking just before we rolled the camera about a uh, filmmaker I know, Norman Lofts, who did a film, One Calm Hour, where he got into Cam H, into the uh, um, highest security schizophrenia award. And obviously there are a lot of um, difficulties and pitfalls with trying to shoot in an institution what are some of the struggles that you went through with this film? Well, you're subject to the, uh, very strict privacy laws, for one thing. Uh, these people are hidden away. Uh, the media almost never gets inside them. I don't know what your friend was in exactly. If it was a forensic ward, it may have been a secure ward, but not necessarily one. A forensic ward meaning... No, it wasn't a forensic ward, yeah. Okay. Well, the forensic ones, meaning people who've committed crimes yeah. to get in there, the kind of people that we're reading about these days, like the bus beheader, Vincent Lee, and uh, Richard Katchkar, the so-called snowplow killer. They're special institutions for people like that, forensic psychiatric institutions, what they used to call the asylums for the criminally right. insane. And nobody gets into these places, basically, or not for very long. We're the only ones in about 30 years who've been allowed in for any substantial period of time, but a year and a half. And um, the staff Staff is very protective of their patients. Um, you hear about these guys in the headlines, and then they disappear off the face of the earth. Right, you know? until you see them on trial or whatever. Exactly, except for sort of fleeting photographs of them here and there. But you, when did you get to hear Vincent Lee, the so-called bus beheader, talk? When did you get to hear Richard Katchkar, the so-called snowplow killer, talk? Well, our film has a case much like that, and he talks for an hour and a half. Right. You get to see into the mind of a man, including while he was committing this horrific crime. He tried to stab a woman to death because he wanted to kill the prettiest woman in the mall. And they actually often remember the details of what happened during the moment, even though they cannot stop themselves. And in the film, it takes a, took a while for him to get to that point, but he actually is telling you what goes through the mind of a, quote, madman in the midst of a murderous, psychotic break. It's, he's a pretty uh, fascinating guy. Right. And you're talking about Sean Clifton, who's the main character in the story, and yeah. obviously the Bouvier families involved and other people. What I like a lot about this film and others that you've made is you have central characters who are driving the story, but the institutions themselves almost become characters. Do you try and do that on purpose? Well, I think it's inescapable. Um, they, um, uh, uh, many people said to me when they heard I was making a film about, you know, a forensic psychiatric patient, they say, oh, well, there's nothing really they can do for these guys these days, is there? And people have this kind of 19th century view of guys in an insane, a criminal right. uh, asylum for the criminal. In fact, there's huge things they can do. And the first time I watched, it was amazing because basically they have the, the treatments have advanced to the point, the antipsychotic drugs and the other kinds of things therapy that they use have advanced to the point where they can take in a guy who is in a floridly psychotic state, perhaps murderous, and within an amazingly short time, 
literally bring him back to his senses and you can have a, the same man who came in sometimes you know uttering gibberish when you first meet him right. within a couple of months you can have a conversation with him. he's kind of landed back on the planet earth and for the layman to watch this sort of jekyll and hyde transformation in somebody is an almost magical thing so when i saw that in the research i thought wow if i ever could capture such yeah. a thing most people have no idea what yeah. they can do it's so true and i I read a quote uh, of yours in an, in an interview. I'm going to be paraphrasing here, but it was something along the lines of, you know, we don't judge people for not de- being able to control an illness like cancer. So why do we judge them for not being able to control their mental illness? So with a film like this, and you know, with what you were just talking about, where you can see that transformation, what do you hope people who see it take away uh, about mental health? Well, there's a controversy right now, for example, in Toronto, uh, the the poor woman who lost her husband to the so-called snowplow killer, like a lot of victims, especially especially soon after the, the offense has been committed. Um, some of them pay lip service. They say, oh, I know he was mentally ill, but somehow they believe it's his fault. This blame has to be attached. Yeah. And the cop in our film, Detective uh, Sean White, wonderful, a wonderful detective from Cornwall, puts it so well. I say to him, what is the difference between somebody who commits murder and goes into a federal prison and somebody with a mental illness who commits murder? Right. He says the difference is the guy who commits murder who goes into prison has a choice. Somebody with a mental illness who commits uh, a murder really has no choice. Right. He's ill. He can't help himself. And I went on to say, I, I said, are you saying that? That somebody who commits some of these savage, horrible uh, offenses that we hear with mental illness is basically could be a good person. He says, of course, they're good people. Most of them are good people. And that's why we must never give up on them. So if I could, I thought that was the most wonderful message. Um, a lot of cops are very hard line about this and yeah. ex- extremely enlightened uh, guy. I thought, well, that's kind of the message I hope that people will get from the film. Yeah. Well, that's a good message. I want to kind of transition out because you talked about yourself uh, being an actor. And I know, um, you know, you were a child actor for some time and uh, start beside some pretty big names, Leslie Nielsen. Um, Is that what led you into a career in film? Uh, you know, obviously, when, you, when you're immersed in that, you could choose to kind of go two ways. You could choose to be turned off or you could choose to embrace it. It seems like you embraced it. Well, it was an accident. I wanted to be Laurence Olivier or the Canadian version of him, Christopher Plummer, have a career doing Shakespeare. I want to play Hotspur in Henry IV Part One and Jimmy Porter and look back in anger. And I'm still available if anybody out there <laughs> offers the parts. There you go. Well, okay, we'll get this video to whoever need, we need to. Right. Um, uh, accidentally, when I was a very successful teenage actor, very busy, a friend of mine called up from Screen Gems Television and American outfit and he said there's a job available in production and the guys who are doing this are the guys who are the center of the quiz show scandals I don't know if you know the movie quiz show wouldn't it be an adventure to work for these guys because they they couldn't work in the states anymore they're up in Canada and they were absolutely the most successful producers in America when this thing happened they had three shows in the top ten so I thought oh this is great I'll try this for three months well I never really looked back I I, they knew I was a producer director I thought I was an actor but you know there you go (laughs) and and your partners in the business you have immediate family members in the business as well do you try and collaborate often yeah my family is a collaborating family Co- collaborate i think with every every single member of my family including in-laws i've somehow you know worked on something or another and i i, I enjoy that i enjoy working with yeah. family yeah and we, we've got to mention your four emmys which i think is still the most of any canadian Yes, for for uh, Canadian programs. Yeah, yes, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And and you know you cross genres too because obviously with NCR you know we're talking about pretty serious subject matter here. But you do comedy as well. How do you choose what projects you want to do and how is your family implicated in that and, and that sort of thing? Well. Um, I often do really dark documentaries, you know, right. cancer, breast cancer, leukemia, <laughs> mental illness, murder. Wearing all murder. black, by the way, Wearing as well. Black, it's my uniform. So really, uh, at the, when I was at the CBC and I, I, I worked for the Fifth Estate for a few years, I needed a break, really. So I began to do the complete opposite, very silly stuff. I was kind of Canada's Mr. Candid Camera for years. I used right, to have right. a weekly spot and do the incredible, most incredibly 
stupid uh, things you can <laughs> imagine. You know, uh, you're walking down the city street, and John comes out of a manhole dressed as a British uh, submarine commander, and he says, "I'm terribly sorry. I'm so embarrassing. I'm the commander of a British U-boat Trident sub nuclear submarine. We were on NATO maneuvers in Lake Ontario. Our radar failed, and I'm afraid we got stuck in the city's sewer system. Would you be a good chap and come down? Give us a." push right. well you wouldn't think that people would would yeah. fall for this but about 50 percent of the people that we stopped canadians being the good polite helpful right. people they yeah. were so that's what i would kind of do to leave in all the dark stuff that i did nice. and uh incidentally i've used my silliness because there is a silly man in here uh, to good end with the documentaries I'm, I'm absolutely outrageous with the the some of these people have committed you know terrible things and uh, sometimes i had people you know serial killers whatever and they won't sign a release because the release is full of this legal language very intimidating I'll go up to them and I'll say uh, look before you sign that I should warn you that um, if you participate in our film we do plan to use your footage in a porn movie and to Photoshop a horse's head on you uh, you don't mind so they're quick to sign right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they, for some reason it works they laugh <laughs> like hell the to hell with yeah, that you yeah. know they think any anybody with some sinister secret agenda you know wouldn't be such an wouldn't idiot sense. basically so uh, yes there's, there's been much crossover between right. the various aspects of my obviously some pretty good improv chops here too yeah. uh, I know you're a regular contributor to the Huffington Post. How does that bridge in with your film career? Well, I've just started doing that. Uh, I used to be a columnist. This is going to really date me with the old Toronto Telegram. I was a youth columnist. I had a column <laughs> called Like It Is, telling as a teenager three times a week. I can't believe the energy. And I was producing a television show at that age at, at 19 um, to, to explain to older people the youth movements of the, of the early 70s. And um, I used we got to bring this guy back as a character, I think. <laughs> yeah. uh, once a ham always a ham never dies never dies what can i say i would be a really good jimmy porter and look back in anger i think by the way <laughs> and before i let you go uh this is an nfb film what role did they play and how important were, were they in the, in the whole thing oh this is a really bad time for documentaries in canada uh it w this was a major major three years in the running project and without the backing of the nfb who are my creative co-producers yeah. uh, they don't just give you money they roll up their sleeves silva buzmagia and my my uh, executive the producer and co-producer and the financial backing of the CBC the documentary channel and the funders to you this a thing like this needs a lot of budget a lot of support you're dealing for three years with really touchy really sensitive people with their families you're constantly putting out fires the huge amount of, of stroking and so on and there is no other place in this country without the backing of the NFB for something this major and those other parties would not be possible I don't know of any other place I could have made a film like this right. but here right Right. today fantastic i feel like we could probably go another 20 minutes but i want to say thanks so much for joining me this was a pleasure thank you john kastner a pleasure thank you very much